It's George Almasri. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. And once again, I truly appreciate uh, you guys tuning in to the newest episodes. I had an opportunity to speak with Matt McKeever. A lot of you already know him, uh, very active in the investment community. I learned a lot about Matt. He's originally from Grand Bend, interestingly enough. Uh, He started off as a CPA and now owns over 100 units. Um, He also has a huge YouTube following, so just a general numbers he's got over 50,000 subscribers over 3 million views in total on his channel so I had to uh, pick his brain obviously trying to find out as much as possible so I hope you'll enjoy the episode and just a reminder if you are looking for opportunities there are tons of them right now Uh, lots of vendor take back options as well so if you want to discuss and see what kind of options I have right now reach out to me and my information could be found at welloff.ca. Have a look and I look forward to hearing from you. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Well Off Podcast, where the goal is to motivate, inspire, and share success principles. I'm here with Matt McKeever. Uh, first time interviewing him. He's a CPA and a real estate investor, also really well known as a, um, uh, he's got a big YouTube following. Um, he's a, a real estate investor in the sense that he focuses on the burst strategy in London, Ontario. I just I looked up his channel on YouTube as of April 2020. He has over 57,000 YouTube subscribers, over 3 million views uh, in total on all of his videos. So um, I'm really excited to have him on. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Really glad to be here. Yeah, I know these are crazy times. Um, who, nobody really expected this to happen, but um, I'm glad we can kind of get on there because what you're doing is really, it, it'll, you'll be able to withstand a lot of things because of the way you've set up your business, which is really cool. Um, I, I wanted to pick your brain on some of the YouTube stuff you do. Uh, before we get into all of that, I wanted to ask you uh, the way I normally do. I wanted you to kind of tell me a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up and some of the things you remember. Absolutely. So uh, I grew up north of London, Ontario. So London, Ontario these days is my base of operations. It's where I own all my real estate. I grew up in a, or I grew up on a farm near a small town named Grand Bend, which a lot of like people in Ontario will be familiar with, but anyone outside of Ontario will have no idea where it is, which is a small rural farming community. And kind of from that experience, you know, farmers are also entrepreneurs, the same way real estate investors are entrepreneurs. And so I think being in that rural environment really rubbed off on me and made me want to, you know, not work the typical nine to five, to not necessarily just get the white collar job in the corner office, but really get in charge and be in control of my financial future. So I think that 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 really was a catalyst for opening up my mind to trying to be in control of my time and my finances rather than working on someone else's time or schedule and working with someone else's finances. So I think that that was one of the critical impacts in my development uh, when I was young, just kind of being exposed to that entrepreneurial spirit. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I, I like the the fact that you're comparing farming to or making the, the connection between being a farmer and an entrepreneur. Um, I was going to ask if you have any specific memories of being a kid and growing up in Grand Bend, anything that sticks out? Uh, so when I was really young, I think the only thing that really stands out is working on the farm and kind of, uh, you know, putting around the farm. So there wasn't like any close towns or anything like that. So it was very much... Uh, 200 acres of land, a bush in the back. So really enjoyed growing up kind of in that setting. So always playing in the bush, you know, ATV, just constantly exploring the uh, little forest at the back of our farm and, you know, playing in the creek and things of that nature. So like definitely very much like think of that rule growing up. And then as I transitioned into high school, started working uh, part-time during high school in grade nine or 10 at a local restaurant, spent a lot of time washing dishes and eventually working my way up to managing the uh, restaurant. Cool. And at what point did you start investing in real estate and where did you, uh, I know you buy, you have all your stuff in London. Is that where you started? Yeah. So the very first property I bought was a house hack. So it was actually a student rental property that was being poorly managed. I bought it, moved into one of the uh, bedrooms. There was a girl already living in the house who stayed. Um, And then I had two of my buddies move in, found another uh, 
roommate off of uh, Kijiji. And all of a sudden I was able to set up a perfect house hack situation where I was able to pay my mortgage, pay all my utilities, pay insurance, even pay for internet and cable and literally be out of pocket zero in regards to my personal cost of living. That to me, if I had to give one piece of advice to anyone, regardless of the state of life they're in or the stage of life they're in, it comes down to if you can minimize your personal expenses, it just frees you up. It provides so much freedom. The average Canadian, you know, according to Stats Canada, spends about 30 or 40% of their income on shelter. So if you can find a way to get your shelter for free, that that's it. Like you're already way above the average Canadian. So for myself, that was a critical step as well, was just getting that house hack situation set up. Right. And the cool thing about that, if you ever were considering buying like a triplex or a fourplex or something like that, there are programs through banks where you don't necessarily have to put 20% down if it's your primary residence. So you can get in for, uh, for significantly less. So I, I agree with you on that. Um, so can you tell me about your journey? Well, we're going to get into a little bit of your uh, real estate investing, then we'll jump into some of the YouTube stuff. But, um, where are you at today with your investments and uh, how did you grow your portfolio? Yeah. So I started in 2010, bought that house hack, then started buying a student rental a year here in London, Ontario, until I kind of hit that five mortgage barrier. That's something a lot of Canadians will be really familiar with. You know, if I had the time machine, I'd go back in time and tell myself about OPM, you know, using B lenders or private lenders and things of that nature. But unfortunately, I wasn't networking. So I didn't know what I didn't know at that time. Mm -hmm. So in 2014 or 2015, I hit that five mortgage barrier. I talking to the bank, I'm like, there has to be a way. I know that there's people that own more than five properties in Canada. And they're like, well, if you go double your income, we'll give you another mortgage. Mm -hmm. So I literally like, changed jobs, changed kind of my career path and transitioned from public accounting, working for BDO to working for a publicly traded pharmaceutical company and was able to like double kind of my gross salary in that regards over a short period of time, got qualified for that next mortgage. But I was like, man, this still isn't like, this doesn't make sense. I was like, financially, I'm doing better than I've ever done before, but it's more and more of a struggle. And that's when I really started dialing in on using OPM and starting to bring on strategic partners where we could buy in their name, have them qualify for the mortgage and really just simplify the process when dealing with a lenders. As I continued to grow, I then transitioned from student rentals into Burr properties. And the reason I was really attracted to Burr properties, and the, for those of you that aren't familiar, Burr stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. And so why I was so drawn to Burr's was I wanted a way to speed up my capital. So you know, living very frugally house hacking, I could save up one down payment a year. And like that was fun at the start buying a house a year, but by year five or six, I wanted to be buying multiple properties. And so for me, speeding up the velocity of my money was the number one solution I could come up with in regards to how I would grow and scale my portfolio. So once I was able to start recycling my money with the Burr investment strategy in 2016, you know, I was able to buy multiple properties. And in fact, I think I got 32 units that year in 2016. So as I continued to grow my portfolio, you know, I just kept looking for strategic additions to my portfolio, often finding private off-market deals through Kijiji, Facebook, and networking. And now here in 2020, I've got over 100 units in London, Ontario, and my primary investment strategy now is still doing that burn investment strategy, but on a larger scale. So with small apartment buildings. So the niche I've really carved out for myself is anywhere between 10 and 50 units, ideally purpose built, you know, three story walk-ups, no elevators, flat roofs, all the really boring, straightforward stuff you think of when it comes to uh, multifamily properties. That's the niche that we're starting to carve out now. So I've started a, a new corporation with a few business partners. We've got, as of May 31st, we'll have about $10 million under management. And the goal is to scale that up to $100 million under management over a short period of time. Cool. That's awesome. Good job. You, uh, you really were able to accelerate your growth in 2016 when you took that huge leap, um, 32 units. And that was all because you, were, you learned how to raise money. Is that right? Yeah. So it was a combination of factors. One was learning how to strategically partner with people, how to use OPM. And then finally, that happened to also be the year I quit my day job. Right. So what was really interesting, the year I quit my day job, I made more money from real estate than I had the previous couple years of grinding really hard in the pharmaceutical industry. 
Yeah. Awesome. And, and were you, did you learn how to use OPM on your own or, or did you, did that happen to also be around the time when you started getting more involved with other realtor, uh, sorry, real estate investors and other real estate groups and things like that? So it originally, I kind of stumbled through it through the school of hard knocks. And then near the end of it, I started attending networking events. And then all of a sudden my trajectory really started to hockey stick where all of a sudden I started hearing everyone else's creative stories, all their creative deals. And from each story, I could just steal one idea, right? And then from those different ideas I stole, I like to think of it as Frankensteining um, strategies, right? So you're creating compound strategies where you're taking multiple different ideas. You're like, oh, like this is really interesting. He was able to do a BTB. And then you're like, oh, this guy was telling me about a perfect burr. And you're like, yeah. well, what if I did both of those together? And all of a sudden you start getting into these nuanced deals that really allow you to find win-wins with yourself and the seller. Mm -hmm. I think that that's as well what really helped me grow. Cool. Well, when I, when I hear 32 units in, in a year that, and I break that down, that's almost three units a month. How, how were you able to do that? Like to go from pretty much one property per year over the last couple, and then to jump into this huge um, acquisition phase, how, how can you just kind of walk me through how you were able to, to do that three units a month? Absolutely. So again, that was in 2016. So to take a step back in 2015, I bought one property. It was a fourplex. So that year was four units. Yeah. The following year, 2016, I left my full-time day job. I think it was in April or May. And I bought a duplex, a triplex, another triplex. And then I ended up finding a 20 unit parcel. So that 20 unit parcel is what, again, really allowed me to get a bunch of units at once. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an interesting story. So for myself, once I quit my day job, I found myself with an excess of time, right? Like a lot of us would. You leave the nine to five, all of a sudden you've got eight, 10 hours a day now uh, that you can play with. Mm -hmm. So I started scraping on Kijiji, just looking you know, for any sort of unique opportunities. I saw this one posting looking for a bookkeeper. And so because my skill set was in accounting and corporate finance, it was somewhere where I knew I'd be able to excel. And just the way the ad was written, it was like, I'm a real estate investor looking for a part-time bookkeeper. You know, I do some interesting projects, things of that nature. I was like, well, this is kind of cryptic. So I like reverse searched the email address, found out it was actually from a local developer here who he was in the process. He had a $20 million parcel of land, some of the most sought after land here in London, where he was going to build 2000 new homes or a 2000 family community. And I was immediately like, oh man, you know, I will work for free. I'll do whatever it takes. I just want to be exposed to you and your ecosystem. And, you know, I'll work for free. It doesn't matter. Um, he was kind of intrigued based upon my application. So we sat down and hit it off immediately because he'd built himself up from nothing as a real estate investor, similar to my story. And I started working for him as a bookkeeper. And about a month into that relationship, he turned to me and was you know, he was in the process of downsizing all of his existing portfolio because he really wanted to focus on this big masterpiece project. And he turned to me and was like, Matt, you know what? I want you to sell my block. And so he owned 20 bachelor apartments on this one corner of a block. He affectionately called them his crack houses. So that gives you kind of an idea of like the condition they were in. They'd really been run down. Um, he owned them outright, so it really didn't matter to him. He was always cash flowing no matter what. And he bought it for a song during kind of one of the down times in the previous decade. And so from that, I was like, he asked me if I would be willing to sell it on Kijiji for him because he's like, you're good with the internet. He's like, just go sell it for me. I was like, I can't, Peter. Conflict of interest because I'm the buyer. And so after he got done laughing at that, he was like, well, what do you want? Or like, you know, how much will you offer uh, for that property? I was like, you tell me a price. He said 400,000. I said, I couldn't say yes fast enough. He literally was like, that was too fast. 440. I was like, yes. And he was like, okay, let's do it. And so I knew that these were really troubled properties and it was going to be a real uphill battle to turn them around. So like, you know, we're literally talking about like drug dealers on the corner, right? So like really had to clean up the building for a couple months. I sank a lot of my time and energy and literally even at times just hung out the building to try and be a good influence and keep an eye on it. But from that kind of intense work and finding the right JV partner who could allow us to buy the property all in cash. So I found a, a JV partner who was a former coworker who had a, a HELOC for up to 800,000. 
So we borrowed 450 from that, bought the property, closed on it. I only really needed to do about 10 or 20,000 in strategic renovations. It was really about getting that tenant turnover and getting the drug dealers off of the corner. From that, uh, within under six months, we were able to get that 440,000 purchase um, appraised for 1.13 million. Wow. And so that was really like when I was like, oh, proof of concept. I'm not crazy. Real estate is the future for myself. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the confidence just run wild. So awesome. that 20 unit purchase was kind of how I was able to cheat my way to 32 units so fast that yeah. year. But once I had that confidence and momentum, there was just no looking back in my opinion. Yeah. Cool. And then, so what, what, what did the year after that look like? So, so the year after that, um, I don't remember the exact unit count, but I probably picked up another 10 or 20 units. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite as robust because I just didn't find the right big building. Yeah. Um, it was 2017. We were coming across, I think it was our lowest uh, uh, inventory on market at that time. So yeah. things were getting very competitive. We were getting into multiple offers. It was mm -hmm. the first time in my investing career I had stumbled into multiple offers. And I was like, market's too hot. I'm going to take a step back. So I was really strategic with what I bought. Now, obviously, since 2017, things only kept going up. So with mm -hmm. hindsight, I wish I would have been more aggressive. But at that point in time, based upon what I would had, I'd grown so much that I was scared of outgrowing my capabilities. And so mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that because even taking on that 20 unit building, it like at times pushed me to my limit. Yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts on that now that you've been through quite a bit? Uh, what are your thoughts on the fear that you were feeling at that time that held you back from continuing to grow? Do you think that that was a good, a good thing that ended up being a good thing that, that you didn't, you kind of slowed down a little bit or do you feel like you should have gone after more? With hindsight, I think I should have gone after more. That being said, for myself, the bigger lesson, and it took me a long time to realize this, is there's no point when you're done learning. There's no point when the journey's over. This entire process of being a real estate investor, personal development, whatever you kind of want to call it, being an entrepreneur, there's no done. It's mm -hmm. a continuous iterative process. And so one of the things I've realized is the only way that I know that I'm growing as an individual is when I can look back on the problems I had six months or a year ago and laugh about how small they are. Right. That's the sign to me that I'm really growing. So literally my day-to-day -day problems today would have been the most stressful thing I could have ever imagined four years ago. And I suspect that the things that are the most stressful thing in my life right now, in fact, I hope four years from now, I'll look back and laugh about what tiny little anthills the mountains I'm trying to climb today were with hindsight. Are you willing to share what some of those fears are today? You don't have to go into detail, but maybe just anything that you can think sure. of. Sure. Yeah. So like, and I'm, I'm happy to go at least high level into detail on this. So sometimes you need to be aggressive in this market if you want to really get good deals. Right now at the time of this shooting, we're still going through, you know, uh, self-isolation, social distancing, quarantine, and all that. So right now there's a lot of uncertainty and volatility in this market and it can be scary and you can naturally want to just sit on the sidelines and just wait things out. But at the same time, I'm acutely aware that it's when others are fearful that often those are when the best opportunities are available because our competition's scared as well. So recently on a 31-unit uh, apartment building, we came to an, uh, kind of a crossroads where we were at the end of our condition period. We'd already asked for one extension because we weren't able to get appraisers in the building because of all the craziness going on. We finally got the appraiser through but then we weren't able to get the final like rubber stamp from the uh, lender on the deal. And so it was either let the deal die and risk someone else coming in and buying it or go firm on like a $3 million purchase when I don't have $3 million in cash. Yeah. And so that's one of those scary things where I was like, you know what? I've got the right connections. We're on the cusp of getting official uh, approval from the uh, credit union. Let's take that little leap of faith. Two years ago, I would have not been comfortable doing that whatsoever. Yeah. I would have let that deal die and I would have been like, you know what? There's always another deal. And there is always another deal, but you also need to be cognizant of when you've got a great deal. Mm -hmm. This property I was looking at buying in London was under 100,000 a unit. The most recent multifamily sales have been around 150, 160 a unit. Mm -hmm. Now these aren't apple to apple comparisons, 
But even if I'm buying bachelor apartments and those comps are for one and two bedroom apartments, there's a strong argument that I'm buying severely, you know, discounted based upon yeah. the current market environment. So it's often knowing and trusting in my numbers is still even to this day, sometimes a challenge because those emotions are always running in the back of your head. Yeah, for sure. And especially at a time like this, where there's so much uncertainty in the market, uh, what are you doing to uh, ensure that you're protected? Because there is obviously like certain tenants are on, having rent strikes and then there's no evictions and this and that. And what kind of precautions are you taking at this time? Certainly right now, we don't find ourselves in an ideal scenario for landlords. That being said, we need to focus on what we can control. So I can't control when the landlord tenant board opens, reopens, right? But I can control the relationship I have with my existing tenants. So before April 1st, we tried to take a proactive measure to reach out to tenants just like a few days before April 1st, because we were also waiting to try and see what the government was going to announce. So it was a little bit of this like, you know, game of chicken where I'm like, I don't want to ask too soon to the tenants because I need to see if the government's going to roll out some sort of crazy program for stimulus or support. But at the same time, I don't want to wait till April 1st and find out some of my tenants are struggling. Mm -hmm. So really building those relationships, keeping clear lines of communication as well as setting expectations. So, so far the month of April has gone well for us. We didn't really see any sort of delinquencies or unpaid rent increase to any substantial degree compared to previous months. So it was pretty much business as usual. Now that we've kind of got the CERB program in place, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to be able to weather the storm without significant disruptions to our business or our business model. That being said, it certainly is a time to move towards liquidity. So making sure that you've got lines of credit. And in fact, I would argue it's even wise for people to take one step further and don't just have that line of credit available, but consider drawing upon it just to make sure that it can't be closed or paused or, you know, it can't disappear on you if all of a sudden the banks change their rules. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that the banks could change their decision around that line of credit in regards to your access to it if you haven't already borrowed from it. Yeah. So, you know, keeping three to four months reserve of operating expenses is really important. As well, we decided to take a proactive measure, start talking to our lenders and at least getting an understanding of what these deferrals uh, these deferral programs look like and what the potential implications are for our business. So again, right now we haven't officially done that for all our properties, but we're ready to do that on the drop of a dime. If we start to see, uh, you know, our perception of the fundamentals or what's going on in the real estate market decline further, we'll really focus on cash flow preservation because if you've got cash flow, if you've got cash, you can weather almost any storm. Realistically, in my opinion, it's the people that go through a cash crunch that don't have liquidity in these uncertain times that are really going to struggle. I, I think that there's very few of us that are concerned that real estate as a business model doesn't work. We're just scared, can our real estate business model work during these uncertain times mm -hmm. till we get to the other, the other side of this tunnel? Yeah, for sure. So it sounds like what you're doing is you're, you're being uh, proactive. You're not waiting around to see what happens. You're making sure you're having conversations with your tenants, setting expectations, setting yourself up financially to withstand certain, uh, certain things that might come your way, certain curveballs and whatnot. So um, I think that's what a lot of investors are, are doing right now. And the ones that aren't are probably going to, they're the ones that are probably going to get hit the hardest. So mm -hmm. yeah. this is not the time to be an ostrich and just stick your head in the sand. Mm -hmm. You need to take ownership of the situation. You need to lean into it and just do whatever it takes to make sure that you and your business survive. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, so we covered a lot of the real estate stuff. Now let's talk about your YouTube channel. Cause obviously that's a huge success too. Thank um, you. Can you tell us uh, how, you got started, where the idea came from, and also how you were able to grow to, to this point? Yeah. So to give a little bit of context and perspective, for the longest time, I thought social media was a giant waste of time. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go back in time to 2015, before I quit my day job, I essentially didn't exist on social media. So I shut down my Facebook profile at that point in time, wasn't on Twitter, Instagram, none of the platforms, no LinkedIn. And it wasn't until I'd quit my job and started trying to convince my friends to invest in real estate so that they could quit their job. Cause it turned out as a 31 retiree, 
you know, a 31 year old retiree, most of my friends weren't available during the day to hang out or go do interesting things or even just, you know, plan on how to buy the next property or take over the world. And I found that to really be a frustrating and lonely experience. So I initially started by writing really long emails to my close friends, trying to explain how they could quit their day job in under five years if they simply followed kind of the investment strategy that I was currently using in London, Ontario. Those emails, they often would be quite long. So we're talking like 5,000 words long. I'm sure you can guess or imagine not many people actually read those emails. In fact, not a single person ever responded to a single one of those emails. At the time, I was also reading a book and it recommended talk to your audience and the language that they want to be spoken to and immediately clicked for me. The reason that we know, like, and trust real estate investing is because it is so tactile, because it's real. It's a physical asset. So it's the fact that you can go touch that building or you can sleep in it, you can live in it, that gives us so much confidence towards this investment strategy or this investment vehicle. So with that, I was like, oh man, YouTube, you know, video, that's the perfect approach to explain to people the power of real estate investing. So I immediately switched over my strategy of trying to convince my friends to quit their day jobs through emails to doing it on YouTube. And while not a lot of them were initially engaged with the content, it turned out strangers were. And so it was a great experience having strangers stumble across the channel, share their input and really get value. And from that, it all kind of snowballed. We ended up creating a community called London on Fire. I would subsequently go on to start a bunch of different networking communities, again, all based around my YouTube channel. But I really started to understand the value in one-to-many conversations. So it's also the reason why I love doing podcast interviews like this. It's a way for me to have a one-to-many conversation. And what happens as, as you grow and progress as an investor, you start to really understand what truly your most limited resource is and that's time. And so at this point in time, when I'm looking at real estate deals, business opportunities, or social media opportunities, I'm constantly trying to think, what is my return on time? When I first started investing, my primary focus was cash on cash returns, because I felt like cash was my most limited resource. But once I learned OPM, JV structures, and things of that nature, I was like, oh, it's time. And it's Mm. always going to be time, because I can't buy more time. So with my YouTube channel today, what that looks like now is on any given day, we probably get about 5,000 views. Our average view is about a seven minute view. So I look at that as me having about 5,000 conversations that were seven minutes long. How could I ever do that as one person without the power of social media or being able to use a platform like YouTube? So I've got massive personal benefit from social media um, and in particular YouTube. So business opportunities, real estate opportunities, as well as just general awareness. One of the things that I think the public discounts when they think about social media is people now really understand and know what Matt McKeever is about. And not only that, it means that I get to cut through a lot of the, you know, BS small talk. People don't come up to me and ask me like, you know, what do you do for a living or where do you live or, you know, what sports team do you follow? They jump in right to the meat of meat and potatoes of the subject matter. Hey, Matt, I'm thinking about quitting my day job. I've got this many properties. This is what I'm struggling with. And now we're at least having a really interesting conversation. And so I enjoy those conversations so much more than I would, you know, the general small talk. Mm -hmm. Um, And then finally, when we're kind of thinking about social media or the power of one to many conversations, I think it's just important as well to understand this is like a legacy that's going to outlast me. So those videos I shot back in 2016, they still get views. They're still making an impact. And what I'm really curious to see with time is what sort of impact does that have on the future generation? So, you know, it's sometimes cool when a family member puts together like a family tree, right? And they put together your genealogy and stuff. And you see that like your great, great, great grandfather was a blacksmith. And you're like, oh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. But really, you just have the slightest concept of what a blacksmith is. Where I hope with my YouTube channel, people can really build a deep lasting relationship with me. And that also extends to like, you know, family relations. So like long term, like the next generation, maybe my kids or my niece and nephews, they'll be able to come up and really understand who I was and what I was doing. And that to me is such a powerful form of legacy. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's really cool. And um, 
I noticed that like some of your videos, especially the Casey Wong series, you have 225,000 views on one of your clips there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I imagine in 2016, when you started your channel, you didn't have that many views. No. What can you attribute to the growth of your channel to get very few people have a kind of following you have on, on YouTube? What can you attribute to that growth? I think the number one thing is consistency. So way too often people want the results without putting in the work. And because of that, they lack to be consistent in their actions. So we like this year in 2020, I challenged myself and my media team. We're doing at least a YouTube video a day. So literally, I think maybe a week or two ago, we hit day 100, which meant we'd put out a hundred videos already this year. Wow. And again, when you think about even small, if even just my average video got a thousand or 2000 views, that, that means I've reached another 100,000 or 200,000 people. That to me is so powerful to know that I can have that reach and that sort of impact. Um, but so consistency is the number one thing. The second one is being really open and honest and fostering a real relationship with your audience rather than a transaction. So I think a lot of people try and monetize their audience too soon. So I think they're like, you know what, I'm gonna go hard for a month, build up my brand, and then I'm gonna launch my t-shirts or I'm gonna launch my hat or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to launch paid coaching. For me, the first, the first two and a half years, I literally didn't charge for anything. Everyone that offered me you know, a free coffee meeting or beer meeting, I took it. Everyone that wanted to jump on a phone call, I did it. And with that, I learned a lot, got exposed a lot, was able to grow my network, but also that meant when it felt right to start offering things to my audience, we had built a real level of trust because I'd built real relationships with that audience, not simply a transaction. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was also not just about educating people, but sharing a little bit of, you know, my personality, my personal brand and things of that nature to really create that connection in addition to just providing great education or information. Yeah. And that's one of the struggles. I think a lot of new content creators that have the right intentions have, is they don't understand that you still need to be personable as well as have great information. So again, if you're monotone, if you're just like awkward on camera, if you've got poor audio, uh, video quality, things of that nature, people won't consume your content. Mm -hmm. And so it can be really frustrating when you're just getting started and you're finding that lack of traction. You're like, oh, I want 50,000 subscribers like Matt does. Just remember that even when you get five viewers, that's like you had a conversation with five people. Mm -hmm. That's still a one-to-many conversation. I think way too many of us want the huge results right away. Um, one, another YouTuber started around the same time as, my, as me and became a good friend of mine, Graham Stephan. Graham now has millions of subscribers, tens of millions or probably hundreds of millions of views at this point. And would I love to have that level of attention and awareness? Sure. But at the same time, I'm so happy with what I have because, again, 5,000 people are gonna watch my videos today. That to me is the type of legacy that 100 years ago was literally impossible. Yeah, for sure. And, and just very quickly, would you suggest if somebody's looking to grow um, their following and whatnot, would you suggest going with shorter clips as in let's say five to 10 minutes long? Uh, so it really depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're looking at building a real presence on YouTube, and if you're looking at doing it in say the real estate, personal development or entrepreneur sphere, my general recommendation would be to focus on 10 minute plus videos. Um, really depends what you're trying to do though. Like if you're trying to be, you know, a comedy duo or a music performer, yeah, you're probably better off doing those shorter, more viral clips. But if we're going to be a content producer, if we're going to just try and like, carve out a niche the way I've done, I think you're gonna be better served doing 10 plus minute videos. Cool. As well, one other little tip would be, focus on the thumbnail and the title. Way too often people get very precious about the quality of the content and then leave the thumbnail and title till the end. But that's really, that is the cover of your book. And whether we like it or not, people choose on whether to watch your video based upon the cover of the book they see. So if you've got a bad thumbnail, no one's going to click it. And unfortunately, no one will consume your great content. So make sure you spend enough time so that people actually want to engage with your content initially, not just trust in the fact that you've got the best content. So if you build it, they will come. No, you need to build it and advertise it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Um, so before we move on to the next section, is there anything else you'd like to share with the people that are listening today? 
I just want to encourage more people to get comfortable going online. The ability to build these relationships online, if you didn't understand the value before COVID, you should certainly understand the value now because so many of us are stuck in our houses. We can't go out into the world. I used to love in-person networking and for a long time, I had so much success because of it. But had I not also created a presence online, all of a sudden, that success would have started to taper off at this point if I didn't create also an online presence. Mm-hmm. So I really encourage everyone, whether you've got an audience of five, 5,000 or 5 million, do yourself a favor, have those one-to-many conversations, create the breadcrumb trail so that people can discover you and find you on their own time, not just on your time. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. That's good advice. Um, So the next section here is the random five. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but I'm just going to, I basically just create these random questions and you just answer the first thing that comes to mind. All right. Uh, The first one is what's the most expensive thing you've ever broken? Oh, the most expensive thing I've ever broken. Um, Like I've probably scratched paint on vehicles. So that would probably be up there. But again, I didn't really care. So I just never got repainted. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot of expensive things in my life, I guess. So yeah, I would think like scratching, scratching the paint on my dad's truck. That was probably the most expensive thing I've ever broken. Yeah, that sucks. (laughs) Okay. Uh, what's your cure for hiccups? Um, oh, so I actually caught upon this the other day. Someone like did a a social media post about it and I've used it ever since. If you tell yourself I have hiccups, and you just say it mentally in your head, the hiccups just go away. Like, it's really crazy. I don't know if it's because I saw someone tell me that, and then I just started believing it and it became true for me. But literally, if you start talking to yourself and you're like, I have hiccups right now, I have the hiccups. And then all of a sudden they just disappear. It's weird. Cool. That's awesome. I'll try that next time. All right. Uh, What movie quote do you use on a regular basis? Oh, um, so one of my favorite movies is Fight Club. And so there's so many good quotes in that movie. But certainly one of them would be uh, the things you own end up owning you. Okay, cool. That works. And I'm glad you you know, because when I thought it, or when I wrote down the question, I, I couldn't think of anything myself. So <laughs> it's good you have it off the top of your head. And uh, the fourth question is, when was the last time you slept more than nine hours? Um, actually, it wasn't even that long ago. So Uh, During COVID, once quarantine seemed definitely like a thing, and before the government started announcing some of their programs, I really wasn't sure about the future of some of my businesses. So I've got my real estate portfolio, my social media business, but I also have a few, like I've got a software company, I've got an education company, a bunch of other things. And so I found myself really uncertain and indecisive. And so I took a, a handful of days off and one of them I slept more than 12 hours. So that would have been like in the month of April at least. So that was awesome. awesome. That's cool. All right. And very quickly, what success principle do you live by? You're the average of the five people around you. Right. Self-explanatory. Very cool. Um, So before we end things, I just wanted to ask you how people could reach you and what services you offer. Absolutely. So anywhere social media is, I'll be there, but certainly on YouTube. So if you guys just want to type in my name, Matt McKeever, Uh, Find me on YouTube. You'll see all kinds of links in the video description um, related to those videos. And you can get in contact with me there. Otherwise, IG or Facebook DMs are a great way to get my attention. Mm -hmm. And right now, the one thing I'd recommend you guys check out while you're on quarantine is Cashflow Tribe. So Cashflow Tribe is my education company. And again, if you find me on social media, we've got links to a free 14-day trial. So you literally, I don't even care at this point, especially during quarantine go binge all the content for 13 days. If you don't like it or you decide that you didn't get value from it, just cancel. You won't get charged. Awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing your story for all those tips. Uh, I wish you the best in in the the rest of your uh, career and whatnot. And um, I appreciate all your time. Thanks, man. I appreciate it too. And for everyone out there, stay safe. Don't get infected. Yeah. All right. Take care. Awesome. As always, thank you for tuning in to this episode. I hope you got something good out of it. I wanted to offer you a free report that I've created just for you as a listener. The report is the beginner's guide to real estate investing. And hopefully this will help you identify what type of properties, what kind of investment properties would be suitable for you. And you can download it by simply visiting 
www.welloff.ca forward slash guide. Again, welloff.ca forward slash guide. Enjoy, and I look forward to connecting with you soon.